All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Jenna Wood, and I am one of the dietitians here with The Giant Company. And today we are still in the thick of November in our Diabetes Awareness Month. And today, because yes, we are dietitians, so we like to talk about food first. That doesn't mean that's the only thing that happens with diabetes, right? We want to talk holistically when it comes to food and medication, because there is no shame in having to take medications. It is a fact of life for many of us. So today we are going to touch on diabetes management with our well-being team, which includes our giant and Martin's pharmacies. So again, I am Jenna Wood, dietitian, and we have Hannah Fritz here, and I'm going to have Hannah introduce herself. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks, Jenna. Yep. My name is Hannah Fritz. I am a pharmacist with Giant Pharmacy. I work um, all over the greater the High Valley area, uh, originally from Allentown. So I saw some people were saying where they're from. Hello. I'm really excited to be here today. And I think we have a really great presentation for you guys. Wonderful. So I do wanna pull this up and this is especially important for today's class. It's important for all of our classes, but just a disclaimer on this is on all of our Eventbrite pages when you register for our classes, but just keeping in mind that these classes are meant more for general nutrition and pharmacy advice. We are not here to replace individualized advice by your healthcare providers, you know, when it comes to medication or individualized nutrition counseling. That is not the purpose of this. Um, so please, you know, to do take a note of our disclaimer. And this kind of goes back to a lot of the questions that were entered into the survey I sent out. A lot of those were very personalized. So we unfortunately won't be able to touch on all of them today. We are gonna get started. So we are going to cover some diabetes manage management basics and I'm gonna pass it over to Hannah. All right, perfect. So diabetes is a huge topic. I could probably talk about it for days on end without running out of information um, to share. So what we did today is we took a few topics, broke them down into what I thought would be the most applicable to most of you on the call. So first thing we're going to do is talk about some medications that are used for diabetes. Uh, the most common ones, and I wanted to talk about specifically how they work in the body, so what the mechanism of action is and how we actually see the results of lowering the blood sugar level. So we'll talk about that. And then I wanted to briefly mention some supplements that are commonly used for diabetes and talk about are those um, effective or not. And then I'll be talking about vaccine recommendations for patients uh, who have diabetes, and then talking a little bit about some pharmacy services at Giant. And then, of course, we'll get to our Q&A. So if you have questions, you can type them in now if you want to save them to the end. That's okay. So to get started, we're looking at some common medications that are used for diabetes and how specifically they work. So on this first slide here, I have some common oral medications, so tablets or capsules that we take by mouth. And then on the next slide, I have some common injectable medications. So first up is probably the most common medication used for diabetes, and it might be the one that you are most familiar with, and that is metformin. And so when we look at how metformin works in the body, it actually has multiple mechanisms of action and how it works. And we'll see with some of our medications, that's the case where they work on separate areas of the body and all of those mechanisms work together to lower the blood sugar, whereas some of our other medications have a very specific targeted single approach to how they work. So for metformin, the first way that it works in our body is it increases insulin sensitivity. So what does that mean? Um, this might have been talked about in previous um, diabetes sessions, but in order for our body to utilize glucose as an energy source in our cells, we need to move that glucose from the bloodstream into the cells. And I kind of like to use an analogy that when glucose tries to open the cell door, it's locked. And so in order for glucose to enter our cells, insulin has to be there to unlock the door and help the glucose in. And so this way that insulin works, um, we're talking about how effectively it works at getting insulin into our cells. This is what we're talking about when we talk about insulin sensitivity. So metformin helps our insulin work more effectively to actually get that glucose from our bloodstream. Um, into the cells where it can actually be used to give us energy. 
Another way that metformin works is it decreases the amount of glucose that is produced in the liver. So yes, we do ingest glucose in our food um, that gets broken down, but our body also creates glucose in the liver. And so metformin will tell our liver to kind of hold off a little bit and not produce as much glucose. And so this in turn helps lower the sugar level. And then lastly, one way that metformin works is it actually decreases the amount of glucose that gets absorbed in our intestines from our food. And so all three of these mechanisms are working together to help bring our blood sugar levels down. All right, next I wanna talk about a group of medications. These are our three Gs. We have glipizide, glimepiride, and glibaride. These medications are all in the same uh, class that's called sulfonylureas. These are very common medications as well for diabetes. And these have a very specific, very targeted approach uh, mechanism of how they work. So we know that our pancreas is the organ in our body that's responsible for producing and secreting insulin. And so these medications, the three Gs, they work by stimulating the pancreas to secrete a little bit more insulin. So they're kind of like squeezing the pancreas to get a little bit of extra insulin out. And so these medications are typically taken right before or with meals when we would need a little extra boost of insulin to help cover the glucose from that meal. And then lastly, to talk about um, some common oral medications, I wanted to talk about Jardians, Farsica, and Invokana. These have become very popular in recent years. Um, they are all in the same class of medications as well. And Jardians, Farsica, and Invokana are all brand name. They are relatively new to the market, so they are a little bit more expensive when we're talking about um, cost affordability for these medications. So these are a little more expensive, whereas metformin and the sulfonylureas have been available for a long time. So they are generic and typically more affordable. But we're seeing some really great evidence for the Jardines, Farsica, and Invokana for their use. And they are being used quite a bit in our pharmacies. So I did want to talk about them. They, like the sulfonylureas, have a very specific targeted mechanism of action. And they uh, work by increasing the amount of glucose that gets excreted in the urine. So typically in our bodies, we will excrete a small amount of glucose in the urine, but typically our kidneys are reabsorbing that glucose back into the bloodstream. And so these medications are kind of preventing that reabsorption. So basically in simple terms, you're peeing out extra glucose for these medications. Um, and that's how those work. So this is not all of the oral medications that are used for diabetes, but the ones that I see the most frequently. And now we're gonna look at the injectable medications. All right, so these three up top, Ozempic, Trulicity, and Victoza, um, probably heard a lot about these in the news recently. They're pretty hot topic lately. So these are injectable medications. They are not insulin, but they are injectable medications for diabetes. There are a few others in this class as well, but these are the ones that I've been dispensing a lot lately. And so like the metformin, they have a, a few mechanisms of action for how they work. So first off, they help increase insulin secretion. So we're getting a little bit extra insulin that's created and secreted. They also help to decrease glucagon secretion. So glucagon is a hormone in our body that when released, it stimulates the liver to produce more glucose. And so it triggers glucose secretion. So by reducing the amount of glucagon that's secreted, we're decreasing the, the sugar level in our body. And they also improve satiety. So what that means is they help you feel fuller longer and sooner. And this is why they're talked about a lot on the news lately is because, because they're making you feel a little bit fuller, Typically, you're eating a little bit less then, and they are causing a side effect of weight loss. And so we have a few questions that were sent in uh, earlier, so hopefully we get to those tonight, asking about you know, how I feel about those used for weight loss, and so we'll get to that um, at the end of the session, but that is the mechanism for how the, the weight loss is being seen. And then I did want to briefly talk about insulin. So there are different types of insulin, and what differentiates them is how long they work. And so we have our long-acting insulin and our short-acting. 
So our long acting insulin works throughout the day. It provides a steady uh, level of insulin. It doesn't peak like our short acting insulin. And so typically this is one injection per day and it mainly helps lower our fasting glucose levels. So what that is, is you go to bed at night, you wake up the mor next morning before you have anything for breakfast. If you check your glucose right then, that is your fasting glucose level. So our long acting insulin helps to decrease that. Whereas our short acting insulin works a shorter period of time. And so typically this is given before or with meals to help lower our glucose levels right after the meal. All right. So I don't have a lot to say about supplements, but I did want to talk about them a little bit because as a community pharmacist, I get asked all the time what supplements are good for X, Y, Z. So for today, we're talking about diabetes. The ones that I get asked about frequently are cinnamon, vitamin D, and chromium. So unfortunately with supplements, there's really not a lot of data available to say if they are effective or not. And so without that evidence, we typically suggest staying away from them. But I did look at the guidelines. And so the American um, Association, uh, the American Diabetes Association, excuse me, is the um, organization that creates the treatment guidelines for diabetes in the United States. They most recently updated their guidelines in January of this year. And so when I was looking through them, they actually have a section about supplements. And they stated that because there is no clear evidence that our vitamins, minerals, herbs, and spices um, can help improve outcomes for our patients with diabetes, they're generally not recommended for helping controlling the blood sugar levels. And so I did want to share that with you, that because there's not a whole lot of information about them, I typically tell people to save their money um, and just stick with the medications that we know work. All right, so uh, we're fully in our vaccine season right now. And so I had to talk about the recommended vaccines for patients with diabetes. This again comes from the guidelines from the American Diabetes Association. These are the vaccines that they recommend all patients with diabetes um, receive. And so that would be the yearly flu shot, the influenza vaccine. If you have not had it yet this year, I definitely recommend stopping in one of our giant pharmacies You've probably seen this sign here. This is a screenshot of one of our flu shot um, signs. Seen those in our store. We do have them currently. They also recommend receiving the pneumonia vaccine. And you might be thinking that the pneumonia vaccine is only for patients 65 and older. And you're partially correct if you think that. The pneumonia vaccine is recommended for everybody 65 years or older. But specifically for patients with diabetes, it is actually recommended to receive these vaccines earlier. So you can receive them anywhere from age 19 to 64 if you have a diagnosis of diabetes. And the reason for this is that we see in the literature that our patients with diabetes have um, an increased risk of acquiring bacterial pneumonia. And so we wanna help protect you against um, this respiratory um, infection, especially this time of year. It is also recommended um, to get the hepatitis B vaccine series if you have diabetes, as well as the guidelines since they updated in January of this year now recommend having the COVID vaccine up to date as well. All right. We do actually, I might as well ask it right now. So somebody asked, um, is it safe to get two of these shots at the same time and then the other two? Yeah, absolutely. So you can get um, any of these combos together at the same time. I will just say that there is an increased risk of having side effects if you get more than one um, vaccine at the same time, which would typically be, you know, sore arm, feeling a little bit down the next day. So it's up to you if you would like to get these together. I personally got my flu shot and my COVID shot at the same time this year. Some people like to spread them out. So it's really a personal decision. Awesome. Thank you. All right, and then right before we get to our um, q and A, I I did wanna briefly talk about a really cool program that Giant Pharmacy offers, which is medication synchronization. So we talked about a lot of medications for diabetes. 
And there's actually quite a few more that I didn't even talk about. I just wanted to go over the most common ones today. But I know that it can be very overwhelming if you're taking a bunch of medications for maybe diabetes, plus maybe you're taking medicines for other things. And so one way that we like to simplify the process a little bit for you is we have a program that lines up all of your medications at the same time. And so you can pick up all of your medications at the same time every month. You have fewer trips to the pharmacy. You don't have to come in multiple times a week uh, or a month to get your prescription. I will let you know that if you are interested in doing this, you can ask your pharmacist. We would be happy to help you with that. Um, sometimes the program can take one or two fills to get everything lined up. You might have to get like a short fill. You know, if you normally get 30 days at a time, you might have to do 15 days to catch you up to all your other medicines. But once we get that settled and on the right track, it really does become much simpler getting all of your medicines at the same time. So I did just want to briefly mention that, that if you're feeling overwhelmed with all your medicines, this might be something that can help. All right. So, Jenna? Yes, absolutely. I do have one question, though. So about the pneumonia vaccine, mm -hmm. how frequently is that a one and done or how often is that one? Yes. Yeah, so it kind of depends if you've had any pneumonia vaccines previously. Okay. I'll just kind of give a brief overview for that. So if you've had no previous pneumonia vaccines, there is a newer one out right now. It's called Prevnar 20. You might have seen commercials about it, where that is a once and done vaccine. So once you get that, you're up to date. Previously, before Prevnar 20, there were two pneumonia shots. You got one, one year, and then a year later, you got the second one. So if you received either of those two, um, there is a way to figure out, you know, which one you need to get, but it gets a little bit more complicated. So if you've had one, you can ask your pharmacist, am I due to get a second one or am I, am I covered? Yes. They said their doctor recommended them get the newer one. It must have been the old. Oh, okay. One yeah. Yep. And we do have, we do have them in our, in our pharmacies as well. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that overview. I feel like it was very detailed, but not too detailed, you know? <laughs> it's not too much information to yes. be overwhelming. Awesome. So we have some questions that were pre-submitted and we do have a handful in the Q&A too. So I hope we can get to all of them. Okay. Let us see. So our first question, do generics work just as well as the name brand options? Yeah. So this is a great question and I do get this sometimes working in our stores. Yes. So generics and name brand have the exact same active ingredient. So we'll talk about metformin, for example. So metformin's been generic for a long time. So I, I have actually never dispensed the brand. I only see the generic. But if you were to get the brand, the brand name is Glucophage. But if you look at it right next to metformin, it's the exact same active ingredient in both. Um, it's just going to be a lot cheaper to get the generic option. So unfortunately, some of our newer medications like the Ozempics, like Jardians and Farsiga, are quite new. And so brand is the only thing that's available right now. But as soon as those become generic, it's going to be the exact same thing, work just as well, and just be a lot more affordable. Right. Thank you. Let's see. Uh, what could happen if I do not take my diabetes medications regularly or as prescribed? Yeah. So I will say as a general rule, because for specific questions, even like this, I would like to see what exactly you're taking to, to give you the best advice. But in general, if you're not taking your medications regularly or as prescribed, they're not going to work as well. If you don't take them, they don't work. And so we might see, um, you know, when you get your lab work done, that your blood sugar levels are not going down. Um, the A1C, which is, you know, the average of your blood sugar levels over the past three months, that might not be going down as anticipated because you're not taking the medication regularly. But if you have specific questions about that, I would ask either your provider or your pharmacist about it to look more specifically at what exactly you're taking. Yeah. And, you know, be honest and open. Like, what are the reasonings that you're not taking your pills as prescribed? Are you not remembering? Is it the expense? What can we kind of do to help you be a little more compliant with it? Because, yeah, I can't help you if you're not taking it regularly. Exactly. And that would be something that I would ask, you know, the provider or the pharmacist mm -hmm. and say, this is why I'm not taking it. Either I don't remember to take it or there's a side effect that mm -hmm. is not 
you know, sitting with me well and we can see if there's something that we can do to change up your regimen to make it more individualized and, and well, perfect for you. Good point. Uh, so how should I dispose of unused or expired diabetes medications? Yeah, I like this question a lot because we don't want to keep a lot of unused or expired medications around to possibly get into the wrong hands. So we'll look at this uh, two different ways. So our oral medications, our tablets, and our capsules, we'll start with that, and then I'll talk about injections afterwards. So there's uh, a few options here. The one that I suggest is the best option is to look in your area if they have a drug take back box. Um, typically these are at police stations, um, but they might have them in like certain hospitals or even some pharmacies. I know, I don't believe any giant pharmacies have take back boxes, but some CVSs, at least in my area do. <laughs> and so I would just Google search, you know, drug take back box near me. Um, that makes it really easy. You just take your medication, you drop it in the box, and then um, the organization is in charge of properly disposing them and you are done. If you do not have one of these in your area, what you can do for tablets or capsules is you can mix it with a undesirable substance in a like a Ziploc bag. And so the CDC recommends either like coffee grounds or even dirt mixing the medications with something that would prevent someone from wanting to dig through it and then sealing that bag up. Yep, someone said police stations have take back boxes. Yep, a lot of them do, um, which is the most convenient way. Agreed, yes. I think one of our pharmacies just had, it was like the national take back day. So many places yeah. have them. National, I, yeah, it is in November. So it just recently occurred. So again, yep. you could look for events like that. Um, sometimes they have like pop-up events so that they will take it back for a day. Mm -hmm. um, talking about injections. Mm -hmm. So because there is a needle involved, it is um, a little bit different of how you need to dispose of them because you want to make sure that nobody accidentally injures themselves when handling your garbage. So for insulin or for like Ozempic or Victoza, one of those medications that has a needle, what I would recommend as the best option is having a sharp container at home. So a sharp container, if you've ever gotten a vaccine in our pharmacy, you probably see it's like a big, big red plastic, hard plastic box that we put our um, injections into after administering them. And so that hard plastic prevents anyone from accidentally poking the needles. And so you can actually get these at home. We are able to order them for you in the pharmacy if you would like to have one of these at home. And then when it's full, you close it up and you send it back to the company and they take care of it. There is also an option to kind of create your own um, sharp container at home. And so if you don't have one of these that comes from a specific company, I like to recommend a Folgers coffee can. It is very durable material. You can't poke through it. And so you can fill the coffee can up. When it's full, I put the lid on and duct tape the lid shut to make sure that nobody can get into it. And then you can dispose that whole coffee can into the trash, but you don't wanna put the needle right into the garbage can um, because it can poke through the garbage bag and someone could injure themselves. Very good information, thank you. All right, this is, so can I safely drink alcohol while on diabetes medications? Okay. Good question. Good, honest question. And honestly, the answer is it depends. So again, I would really like to see exactly what medications you're taking and have a discussion with you before answering this generally for everyone. Um, but I will say if you are going to drink alcohol while taking diabetes medications, um, if you've determined that it's safe for you, just watching out for the sugar levels in your beverages, um, because we are trying to lower the glucose levels um, in our body, we want to make sure we're not having super sugary, um, delicious drinks <laughs> all the time. Uh, would definitely be a moderation situation. But I, again, I would like to see more individually what you're taking and have that one-on-one -on -one discussion. All right. So what are your thoughts about all of those injectables that you mentioned? 
Are they good for everyone? What are some long-term consequences you know of? And do they affect the liver or kidneys like some other ones do? All right. Um, sorry, I just wanted to see in the chat, you did say it was safe to put the filled coffee canister of used needles into the trash. Yes, so you can fill up the you know, Folgers coffee can or something that's super hard plastic that you won't be able to penetrate. Fill it up, put the lid on, duct tape all the way shut to make sure nobody can get into it. And then yes, you can dispose of that into the trash. And I definitely think your suggestion of being able to order a Sharps container and then have that mailed back, definitely the best option. Yes, that is ideal. Um, it's really easy because then again, it's not your problem. You just mail it back to them. Um, but that is another like at home way to do that. Okay, so for these eosempic craze, it's all over the news lately. Mm -hmm. So what are my thoughts on it? I think it is a great medication for lowering blood sugar. It has great um, evidence for lowering the A1C. And so, um, yeah, it's a great option. Is it good for everyone? I can't say that. I can't make a blanket statement that says it's good for everyone, but if you are interested in it and listening to me talk about it earlier, the way that it works, you think that that might be something good for you, I would definitely recommend talking to your provider about it. Um, as far as long-term consequences, unfortunately, this medication has only been available and on the market for a few years. So to say what it does 20, 30 years from now is something I can't do right now, but um, they are, you know, monitoring it as patients are taking it and it went through all the clinical trials. And so it was approved um, to be used. Um, I will talk about the weight loss aspect of these medications because I get asked about that a lot as well is, um, you know, how much weight am I going to lose all this and that. Like I said, with the mechanism, it does make you feel fuller. And so typically you're not eating as much while on these medications as maybe you were before them. And so you can see weight loss as a side effect with these medications. Now, the thing is, is that that mechanism is only working while you're using the medication. And so if you were to go off of this medication and stop using it, the weight loss would most likely stop because the medication is not working. You know. I can't say exactly it would be something to work with your your team about, but I do get asked about that. If I stop taking it, am I still going to lose as much weight as I was when I was on it? Most likely not. Um, do they affect the liver or kidneys like some other medications do? Um, no, these medications are not um, working specifically in the kidneys or the liver, and so we're not really seeing that they're, you know, hard on those organs. But if that is a specific concern that you have, I would definitely ask your provider to look into all of your medications and make sure that they, other medicines that you're on are not uh, affecting those organs as well. That's great. Uh, so it is 7.30. So if anybody has to hop off, totally understand. I'd love, Hannah, if you're okay, maybe a couple more questions. Yeah, sure. Okay, perfect. So we already really touched on uh, supplements and things like that. So I don't think we really need to get into this one, but I do really want to get into some of the questions that are in the chat that we have, because there are so many. Um, very quickly, let's see. So do you need a prescription to get the hepatitis vaccine? No, no, you do not. Okay. Uh, let's see. So let me scroll all the way back up. I guess if you want to briefly touch on what you all provide in terms of devices for actually checking blood sugar, because somebody asked, and I've heard very similar things about, you know, the like CGM monitors versus mm -hmm. finger sticks being, you know, different levels of efficacy. Like sometimes they'll get really high readings on the finger stick and not so high on the CGMs. So oh, okay. any thoughts there? Um, you know, I don't really know the difference between the efficacy of them. I do know that a lot of patients typically like the continuous glucose monitors, like the Freestyle Libre or the Dexcom, because you don't have to constantly prick your fingers. Yeah. And um, it's really convenient because you can either use your phone or the reader and check whenever you want, versus if you're limited to a certain amount of test strips per month, like having to limit you know, one or two times a day. 
Um, but as far as the efficacy goes, I, that is something that I would have to look into because I'm not exactly sure the difference between those. Yeah. And I know like there are very many things can affect, you know, the finger stick ones, you know, if your hands are washed, if there's anything on them, very mm -hmm. many things, you know, if your hands are cold, like all these little things can inhibit that. So I think a lot of times just consistency. So what is your blood sugar on a consistent basis using one of them? Cause at least you can track trends that way. Exactly. Uh, let's see. Do people with diabetes need to take insulin for the rest of their lives? Well, it depends. So if we're talking about type 1 diabetes, um, yes. So type 1 diabetes, and this might have been covered in previous discussions, but type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disorder where it actually, your pancreas no longer produces any insulin, zero. And we need insulin to lift. We need insulin to utilize the glucose as energy. And so for patients who have type 1 diabetes, which is typically diagnosed in childhood or adolescence, um, you do need to use insulin in order to function for the rest of your life. As far as type 2 diabetes goes, the answer is it depends. So type 2 diabetes, your body is still producing insulin. Uh, it might not produce, be producing as much as you need, or your insulin might not be working as effectively. Um, and so sometimes insulin is used to treat type 2 diabetes, and sometimes you can manage it with um, you know, lifestyle and oral medications. So if that's something that if you're on insulin and you would like to work your way off of it, I would definitely recommend asking your provider about that and seeing if that's something you could work towards and what you, what steps you'd have to do to get there. Okay. So there's a lot of confusion about the sharps disposal. Um, okay. I guess a lot of confusion about the coffee canister piece of it all. Like, is that a general recommendation? Um, should they make sure a lot of the things will come with a cover for the needle as well? So people are a little concerned about okay. that aspect. Sorry to confuse you with this. <laughs> so again, the best thing is the sharps container. And you can ask your pharmacist about this, if they would be able to order you one, or sometimes your doctor's office might be able to get you one for free. Um, but that was something that you'd have to ask individually about. The coffee can uh, uh, example is really like the second best option of what you can do if you if you cannot get a sharps container at home, which is what I recommend is a sharps container. And so anything that is hard plastic, so we're thinking, and the coffee can was just an example. So the Folgers coffee can, um, like a laundry detergent bottle, something that is very hard plastic, not that you could poke a needle through it, is something that you could use to dispose of the medications. Um, they might come with um, caps on the needles, but it's typically not recommended to recap yeah, after you've yeah. already uh, injected. So I do not recommend recapping the needle because you have an increased risk of poking yourself in the finger. Um, and so directly disposing into the sharps container is 100% the best option. Agreed. Yeah. Someone said they use a kitty litter jug that has a very tightly screwed needle. They tape it really closed. Cause yeah, if you think about the type of plastic that the sharps container is and the type of plastic that these containers are, they're very similar, sturdy plastic. Yes. Yeah. Um, old bleach bottles. Yes. Yeah. So I love the idea of knowing, see, I would not have known that you can go up to your giant or Martin's pharmacy and ask about ordering a sharps container or going to your doctor. So best option. Best if, practice, you know, yep. Yeah, if for some reason you cannot <laughs> uh, get to a sharps container at the time. Very good, let's see. Um, a couple of questions about, you know, how does your doctor decide which medication is best for you? Well, that's a great question for your doctor. And I think having that open, honest conversation, like Hannah went through very detailed of how those different medications work and hopefully your physician is looking through, you know, which one is going to be best and most helpful for whatever is causing your symptoms. And maybe you need to be on more than one. And that is something they will decide as well. Anything else you want to add there? Yeah, definitely. Um, they'll be looking at, you know, all aspects of the medication. So how it works, they'll be looking at potential side effects, um, Cost is a big one. You know, what's affordable, what's on the insurance formulary is a big one. If you want to take 
oral medications, if you don't want to use anything that's an injectable, or if you do want to use an injectable, there's a ton of different um, factors that play into it. And that's why it's so individualized to you. I love it. We have a lot of, like a really, really detailed question about Ozempic in the Q&A. And I love, you know, how detailed the question is. People are really curious, you know, how safe it is. How can people tell if they've lost their appetite due to the medication or due to other things like possibly depression? You know, how does it, you know, let's say maybe you have difficulty going to the bathroom. Is the glucose actually getting removed like it's supposed to? So these are great questions for your physician. I would probably go and ask these particular things because again, they're going to weigh pros and cons of if depression is a risk. Maybe this is not the type of medication you'll be on. So that's the kind of thing, being open and honest with your healthcare provider so that it can help you choose the best option for you. And I think that's great. And a lot of, I know the um, appetite suppression, a lot of it, they do slow down your GI tract as well, which can lead to that satiety, which, you know, you can slow your GI tract down too slow too. So, you know, being aware of the potential side effects. So when your medications come with that really long packet, maybe reading it the first time you're on those medications. Uh, you'll learn a lot, but you'll know what to look out for too, which I think can be helpful. Definitely, yeah. How about re uh, recommendations on the RSV vaccine? What can you tell us? Oh, sure. Yep, so the RSV vaccine um, is recommended for all patients uh, 60 years of age or older, it is, um, RSV is typically something we hear about in children um, because it can be life-threatening in children as an infection, but we are seeing it um, infecting older adults as well. And the idea is that we're protecting our older generation and so not spreading the, vac the infection to kids. Um, we do have these in all of our giant pharmacies as well. I did not mention it today because this the RSV vaccine came out, I think, July of this year, and the American Diabetes Association guidelines were updated in January, so it was not available at the time that the most recent update was, but most likely they will be adding that to the list of, of uh, recommended vaccines for patients with diabetes, but again, it is currently only for patients 60 years of age or older. Sounds Great. Um, perfect. There's a couple other comments, things about side effects that they've, yeah, like UTIs, yeast infections are definitely side effects of some of these ones, especially ones that are spilling the glucose into your urine because you're creating that environment where there is glucose and we know bacteria like that and yeast can like that. So if that's a big side effect you see and that's not one you're willing to live with, talk to your doctor, maybe there is notifications or, uh, you know, you can change that up. Yeah. I did see someone ask if the RSV was a once and done or if it's multiple times. Currently it is a once and done. So once you get it, you're, you're set. <laughs> someone said they got RSV, COVID, flu, and shingles all at one time. They do not recommend. <laughs> I wouldn't either. <laughs> but now you're all set. But yes, I think, I think two at a time is normally... <laughs> <laughs> a good option. But these have been so fantastic. I'm sorry if we didn't get to your question. Um, and I really am very grateful for Hannah for being here from our giant pharmacy. Uh, and most of these things she mentioned should be at our Martin's pharmacies as well. Um, but I really am very grateful for everyone joining us today. And please, I hope you have a wonderful Thanksgiving if we do not see you in our next two classes over the next two days. Uh, and please, I will send out the recap email with everything that you need to know. But thank you again, Hannah. This was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me, Jenna. And thank you for everyone who attended. Um, I hope you learned a lot and had a good time and happy holidays.